Welcome to The Car Guys and this week we're going to take a look at Toyota and specifically the development of its new hydrogen combustion engine H2 and its future strategy. A potential futuristic game changer that just might make obsolete and destroy the entire battery electric vehicle industry at a stroke. Yes, that's right, a plentiful natural source of unlimited power that removes the need for large heavy batteries, allows for quick refueling, gives long range, eliminates greenhouse gases, and emits water as a byproduct. So this week we're going to look at whether hydrogen is too good to be true, its benefits, its drawbacks, and why Toyota seems to be the only car company that isn't drinking the EV Kool-Aid. <laughs> A year ago, I made a film called The Big EV Lie, in which I talked about the way electric vehicles were being pushed on us all through government legislation under the guise of being climate saviours. That video has been seen so far by 1.9 million people, and it's inspired plenty of informed debate. It also prompted YouTube to append the wrong definition of climate change below it, further proving my point on media bias and misinformation. What it also highlighted is that there are many of you who are concerned about the relentless drive to EVs, especially those of you who do not own or cannot use their own power source. Now there's going to be plenty of information in this episode and so like my big EV lie episode, I will put chapter markers in so that for those of you with short attention spans, you can skip to the engine part without having to endure trivial things like history and background and strategy. A couple of years ago, comedian and car collector Jerry Seinfeld on the Spikes Car Radio podcast said Toyota is betting big on hydrogen. Since then, I've been paying more attention to what Toyota has been doing behind the scenes, while the rest of the automotive industry has been pushing, wrongly in my opinion, towards EV-only adoption despite plenty of evidence that it does not solve the basic problem of reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases. Toyota's strategy, as you can see here, is one of a multi-pathway, a balanced and non-partisan exploration of all future technologies with a view to supporting those that make the most sense for the planet and for its customers. Toyota believes it is way too soon to be concentrating on only one low or zero emission power source to the exclusion of all others and blindly driving EV adoption to the potential detriment of the planet and all of us. Toyota is therefore currently pursuing a different strategy to all other car companies, and that means catering for electric only, hybrids, and crucially, hydrogen fuel cell and hydrogen combustion technology alongside battery electric technology. Toyota's president, Akio Toyoda, was quoted in the Wall Street Journal as saying, people involved in the auto industry are a largely silent majority and that silent majority is wondering whether EVs are really okay to have as a single option. But they think it's a trend, so they can't speak out loudly because the right answer is still unclear and we shouldn't limit ourselves to just one option. And that's why Toyota doesn't want to bully or shame people into its cars, as Western governments seem intent on doing. It wants to offer solutions to the important problems that we all face. Remember, this is the company that was ahead of its time and all of its competitors in 1997 with the Prius, the first mass market hybrid vehicle, bought by the socially conscious and taxi drivers everywhere. Given its position in the world market and its record for innovation, when it comes to new technology in transportation, only a fool would ignore or discount Toyota. Toyota's strategy is to support what it deems to be a short-term demand for battery electric vehicles for advanced nations with the right infrastructure. But it's smart enough to realise that developing nations would need to continue to offer hybrids to cope with the lack of electric charging infrastructure and for the longer distances involved. And Toyota is of course always focused on the future, which having done all the research and development, it believes is hydrogen. Toyota believes that hydrogen and carbon neutral fuels will be the dominant source of power for vehicles once the rest of the world realises the obvious problems of scaling up EVs in terms of the lack of rare components, the mining required and the electricity requirement. Don't get me started on that. So that brings us to hydrogen 
and the very real possibility that this, rather than electric, will be the fuel of the future, especially when you learn about Toyota's existing H2 and its new revolutionary hydrogen combustion engine. You may already know that Toyota has the Mirai, the consumer hydrogen vehicle, based on fuel cell technology. And it's also worth mentioning that Hyundai has the Nexo. Both are available to buy now, are sufficiently space age, but they are both hampered by a tiny hydrogen refueling network. According to Auto Express, there are six hydrogen fuel stations in the UK. Yes, you heard that correctly, six. But don't worry, there are five more planned. In the US, there are just 60, 59 of which are in California. And virtually no other car makers are currently researching hydrogen as they've been heavily incentivized to push EVs instead. Ford alone was recently awarded a $9.2 billion low interest loan from the US Department of Energy to build three battery factories. You can't help but think though that if the same grants and loans and enormous incentives were available for hydrogen research in the same way that they have been for EVs, we might be a lot more further along the way and a lot more of the current challenges with hydrogen could have been solved. But before we get too deeply into hydrogen, here are the benefits and negatives of using hydrogen to power your car. First of all, it's easy and quick to refill the tank, two minutes potentially, instead of hours. A smaller battery is required, saving on rare elements. They can be used in very cold temperatures, up to minus 252 degrees C or minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit. They already have a range of 300 to 400 miles. Hydrogen can be generated on the site of the actual refueling station, and you can therefore use existing petrol station sites. Life cycle emissions are about the same as EVs. You can retain engine noises in hydrogen combustion. Hydrogen plants can also be used to store excess renewable electricity energy and hydrogen is especially good for large vehicles such as trucks, ships and heavy machinery, unlike batteries, something that JCB knows all about. And before the evangelists fill the comments section of this episode with the negatives of hydrogen, here they are. Obviously the complete lack of refueling infrastructure is the biggest public worry about the dangers of hydrogen. Governments are already sold on EVs and therefore not open to new ideas. The creation of hydrogen takes a lot of energy. It's currently using natural gas, but they hope to be using renewable in the future. It's expensive because of the lack of market penetration and hydrogen combustion, as opposed to fuel cell, may not give that long a range. And of course, those same EV evangelists are conveniently forgetting that not only have EVs had all the R&D and government money to help develop them to a more advanced degree than they would otherwise have had, but they also seem very quiet when it comes to mentioning the negatives of EVs and batteries, where coincidentally the answer is often that's being developed very soon, or the even better, of course it's possible, it's just not actually financially viable to do so. Isn't it sad that instead of actually attempting to solve the future of transport, the very first thing we do is split into rival factions, neither side listening to each other, but both thinking they are right. This is an area where EV evangelists like to dispel hydrogen as an alternative energy source. And it's true that it does take a large amount of energy and resources, primarily natural gas, using the steam methane reforming method to create it on Earth so that it can be used as a fuel. And here comes the science bit, courtesy of the US Department of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy that explains the process. The methane in natural gas reacts with steam under pressure in the presence of a catalyst to produce hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and a relatively small amount of carbon dioxide. Steam reforming is endothermic, that is, heat must be supplied in the process for the reaction to proceed. Subsequently, in what is called the water gas shift reaction, the carbon monoxide and steam are reacted using a catalyst to produce carbon dioxide and more hydrogen. In the final process, called pressure swing adsorption, carbon dioxide and other impurities are removed from the gas stream, leaving essentially pure hydrogen. And there is another method called partial oxidation, which yields less hydrogen, but it is faster. So now you know. To reduce the fossil fuels used in hydrogen production, Japanese companies are using all forms of renewable energy to create the refined hydrogen needed for its hydrogen engines. This is including hydrogen from geothermal power generation, hydrogen from solar power, 
and hydrogen from sewage biogas. Though it should be highlighted that this increases the cost of the hydrogen produced by a factor of four compared to making hydrogen with fossil fuels. Unless, of course, it's all scaled up. Hydrogen is already used in industry for things like oil refinery, fertilizers, metals, food and electronics. And as you can see here, by 2050, the US Department of Energy expects it to be used for generating power for medium and large cars, passenger ships, buses, as well as its current industrial role. Hydrogen can be manufactured on site at the refueling stations, or it can be transported in CFRP, carbon fiber reinforced plastic tank resin line tankers. A great deal of research has gone into developing extremely safe fuel tanks for the hydrogen in Toyota's Mirai. And as you can see here, this is a tank being shot with a high caliber bullet to prove that a violent rupture would not cause any kind of explosion. Unlike, for example, a petrol or gas tank. At last, now we're talking about cars and car engines, the bit you've no doubt been waiting for. When it comes to hydrogen cars, we have the aforementioned Mirai, now in its second generation. And I don't mind telling you that it's head and shoulders above the first gen car, which looks a bit, eh, uh, Prius-y. The second gen Mirai is a luxurious five-seater saloon with independent suspension, rear wheel drive, and it's powered by a hydrogen fuel cell driving electric motors, which means the only emission is water. Here's how the electricity is generated in the fuel cell. The car takes in oxygen from the air, which meets hydrogen from the high pressure hydrogen tank in the fuel cell. Many fuel cells combine to form the fuel cell stack. Hydrogen is supplied to the negative anode and activates, releasing the electron. Then the electron flows to the positive cathode to generate the electricity. After releasing the electron, the hydrogen becomes a hydrogen ion, moving to the positive cathode and bonding with the oxygen in the air, forming water. Hydrogen and oxygen come together in the fuel cell stack to supply the electricity to the electric motor via the power control unit. And there's no recharging because of course, as you can see here, you just refuel it conventionally using a pump that takes a couple of minutes. Oh, and the range of that car, it's 400 miles thanks to three high pressure hydrogen storage tanks, as you can see here. While I was researching this film, I'm pleased to say that some encouraging car maker hydrogen news was announced, including BMW has said that it's making a hydrogen fuel cell a no cost option for its SUVs. Ford is working on a hydrogen powered E Transit. There will be a hydrogen Ineos Grenadier. And there are rumors that Rolls Royce will offer a hydrogen powered Spectre. So perhaps the rest of the automotive world is finally waking up to the benefits of hydrogen in a balanced energy future. Or maybe the other manufacturers are just hedging their bets. So that's the hydrogen fuel cells in action. Now I'm gonna talk about the two new types of hydrogen combustion engines. And this is where petrol heads are getting pretty excited because hydrogen combustion means proper engines, not batteries. And it means engine noises but no emissions. Toyota has been testing its H2 hydrogen combustion engine in motorsport with this GR Corolla H2, and also on the roads during the 2022 World Rally Championship in Belgium, partly to subject the new technology to extreme test conditions, but also because combusting hydrogen gives a shorter range overall. In the course of just one racing season, Toyota has been able to increase hydrogen combustion power by 24% and torque by 34%. Range has been extended by 30%. Refueling time has been reduced from five minutes initially to just 90 seconds, putting the H2 on a par with the conventional petrol engine. And as recently as July 2023, Toyota was racing again with the liquid hydrogen powered Corolla and synthetic fueled GR86. So those are race cars with all the speed, sounds and drama of the internal combustion equivalent, but they're emission free and they exist today. And don't even get me started on these hydrogen converted AE86s, cool Japanese retro chic, but powered by the future. Toyota has also recently revealed the prototype practical family Corolla Cross H2 concept, the first hydrogen SUV, which is powered by a 1.6 liter three cylinder turbo engine, but with hydrogen direct injection technology and using the same technology refined in the Mirai. And then there's this. 
announced in 2022 in a collaboration with Toyota and Yamaha, a hydrogen fueled V8 engine using hydrogen combustion, which means you retain a rich engine note whilst generating no harmful emissions. A V8 hydrogen engine. See what I mean by game changer? Yamaha president Yoshihiro Hidaka said of the innovative new engine, hydrogen engines house the potential to be carbon neutral while keeping our passion for the internal combustion engine alive at the same time. Based on the 5 litre V8 in the current Lexus RC Coupe, Yamaha claims 455 brake horsepower and 400 pounds feet of torque. But just look at that 8 into 1 top mounted exhaust manifold. What a beast! Unlike many blinkered people on YouTube and the internet, it's difficult for me to believe that it is even possible for us to generate enough electricity to power all those EVs, homes and businesses through renewable sources. Put simply, we can't. And the sooner we all realise that, is the sooner we can begin investing heavily and pushing other forms of future fuels. And that means synthetic fuels and hydrogen. Yes, on some days, in some countries, renewable energy can appear as if it can power our needs. But it's only brief, it's unreliable, and it's only based on a very small installed base that we have right now. What many EV evangelists fail to take into account is what happens when there are 10 times as many EVs, and we're all using electric boilers instead of gas ones, and electric showers, and electric cookers, electric everything. No amount of solar panels made with fossil fuels and wind turbines made with fossil fuels are going to meet that demand. It doesn't matter how pig-headed you are or blinded by EV propaganda, the numbers simply don't add up. What happens when we have two EVs plugged in charging and you cook your dinner, have your shower and heat your house? Based on our current electrical infrastructure in the ground and in our walls, it cannot cope. Look up Ohm's law if you want to enlighten yourself we would have to upgrade the entire electrical infrastructure. And we don't have enough natural resources to manufacture the amount of batteries, wind turbines and solar panels to generate enough electricity to run this mythical renewable utopia. Only nuclear comes close and thanks to the activists, those are being shut down or not being built in sufficient scale to offset the shortfall left by renewables. Toyota gets it, but for some reason the West is wedded to EVs, blindly thundering towards the horizon without stopping to consider the massive environmental damage that all this battery manufacturing and renewable power sites are generating. All we're doing is replacing one damaging process, oil refinement, with another, battery production. If only the world used some of the vast investment going into EVs to fund alternative fuel sources, we might actually stand a chance of making a difference. If you believe that we even need to. Thank you very much for watching this episode on Toyota's hydrogen strategy in its new V8 hydrogen combustion engine. I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you found it useful, I hope you were entertained, and I hope it made you think. If you like what we're doing on the car guys, please subscribe, leave comments and likes, there'll be another episode next week.